Um, so, um, Patty and I went on vacation. Yay! She said, you know, I got a new bracelet and a new yeah. necklace from a vendor in, in uh, Charlottesville, right? Charlottesville, yeah. In Charlottesville at the mall there, not the mall mall, like the city mall in Charlottesville. Yeah. It was um, really wonderful. And, and I, so I was looking up about vacation. Um, vacation is a late 14th century word coming, uh, meaning freedom from obligations, leisure, and release from some activity or occupation. It's from the old French, vacation, meaning, uh, uh, meaning vacancy or vacant position. It's directly from Latin, which most of uh, uh, English is, from uh, a vacationem or vacatio, meaning freedom, exemption of being free from duty, immunity earned by service. Mm. That's interesting. Um, and vacara, meaning be empty, free to leave, to abandon. Mm. Oh. Mm. So we went to uh, Virginia, this is where we went, in case you didn't know, or in case you didn't see any of the pictures on Facebook or anything. We went to Virginia, and um, we were going there mainly to visit family, Patty's family, um, but we did some stuff on, one, on both ends of the time that we spent at um, this house that was rented in the, uh, off the Shenandoah River. And it was beautiful there, and there's pictures on Facebook if you want to go look about uh, where we stayed, and it was quite beautiful there. Um, First, though, we, uh, when we got to Charlottesville and picked up the car, um, we went to the mountains, but we went to a place called Synchronicity. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, even though I talked about it last week, if you happen to watch me live last Sunday. I spoke for about a half an hour, and you can go up and, and watch that. Um, the place is called the Synchronicity Foundation, and it's a meditation um, place. Um, they don't call it a retreat. And, um, you know, when, when you go to these places, you kind of naturally say retreat, the something, something retreat. And I started thinking about that, and I remember that, um, I don't remember what he changed to, but Dr. Holmes used to say about a Silomar, we don't go to a Silomar to retreat. And then I started thinking about that word. And if you break down that word to R-E and then T-R-E-A-T, you are re, which means bringing back, starting over, doing again, treating. And what is our most primary uh, form of prayer is treatment. So retreating is not really that bad unless, unless you're talking about it in a military way and there's some, some sort of a, a onus upon that. But going to a retreat is not a negative thing because you're not retreating from something. From something, you're retreating something. Yeah. Anyway, this place synchronicity was really beautiful, and there were deer running around and looking at us, going, "Come close, come close." Beautiful, beautiful place, um, and a lot of great energy there. And then from there, and you, you can uh, you can go up and watch because I talked about synchronicity a little bit, and Barbara talked about it a little bit, right? right uh, before this, um, that the idea of synchronicity, I'll say real quickly, I believe was like time. It's kind of a man-made um, concept because synchronicity is just the inevitable consequence of our beliefs and the law bringing whatever it needs to bring into line, to bring into our experiences what we just decided, declared, and agreed that we want in our lives. So that's enough about that. You can watch what I said there. So then we went up and we visited um, family up at this house off the Shenandoah River, and we had a lot of fun. We did a little canoeing and um, went down some rapids, and that was kind of fun and exciting. I was going to bring my phone, but then I thought, hmm, oops, something. Yes. <laughs> it's a little cockeyed. It's not like it's something I do all the time. Right, exactly. Oh! Uh, not worth it. Okay, so. <laughs> So that was fine, and that was fun, and it was family. So the, the, enough of that. Um, and uh, we went into these caverns, 
that was real cool. And there's a lot of pictures and a few videos about um, being in these caverns, and it's 50, 55 degrees in there at all times, no matter what's happening. And, and that mountain is granite, so theoretically, no matter what would happen above, you really wouldn't know in there because of the way it's built. Then um, um, I want to talk a little bit, for Bonnie's sake, about a play we went to see. We went to the American Shakespeare Center, which is a recreation of the um, Blackfriars Theater from um, the 1400s in London. And um, they perform Shakespeare plays and, and other classical plays, actually, um, with full lights on. And, and although the seats are comfortable, they say, they say in their advertising, it's, it's just the way you would have seen the play in Shakespeare's time, except for um, uh, something on the seats for comfort and air conditioning um, <laughs> and indoor plumbing. <laughs> Other than that, the actors spoke without um, microphones. They even performed like a little oleo, a little um, uh, music before um, at halftime um, of songs of various types, not just songs at the time. They sang rock and pop songs, and, but they sang without. It was all, uh, uh, not acapella, it was all uh, without sound and lights and all that kind of stuff. So it was fun, and, and it was really interesting, the story of Antony and Cleopatra. That was the play, and, and I didn't know that play, but I knew the story. We all kind of know the story from that fabulous movie with <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor, um, which almost ruined the studio, actually. Um, but the story is, is, very, is very interesting, and, and uh, as I read about the play, I read it's one of the considered one of the better written plays of Shakespeare, and it was a later play in his life. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun, fun experience, and uh, I just wanted to get out there. But anyway, um, <laughs> after that, the next day on Friday, we went back to Charlottesville. So we could have kind of a, a day um, by ourselves before we came back here. And also, I wanted to do something that was um, historical, because Virginia is extremely historical part, and it's gorgeous. So I arranged for us to go visit Monticello. Monticello, in case you didn't know, is Thomas Jefferson's home. He spent 40 years designing and having it built, and lived in a teeny tiny house until it was finished building. He pretty much just retired there. Um, he was off and around um, being Secretary of State, and then he was pre third president, and then he was, he was also the ambassador of France, and he was gone a lot, especially during the building of the place. And it was very interesting, it's beautiful. Um, great, huge grounds, I forgot how many acres they said. Do you remember, 5,000, maybe more. Yeah. It was huge, it was huge. So we took a tour of the house. Very interesting architecturally. The beds were like, <coughs> like that. They had this cool thing in his room. I think it was in the guest room too. But in his room, because he had his own private um, bedroom, the closet was above the bed. He went up, he went up a stairway, and it was in like a little attic <coughs> above the bed. We didn't get to go up there. But um, and then he had these. Um, sort of skylights there so light would go in there because you didn't want to go in there with a candle and all your clothing. So, but it was very interesting. The beds were really small. They were like twin beds or less. And um, there was one, um, there was one, one room for uh, his best friend, not John Adams, but it was Monroe, anyway, and his wife. And it was a twin bed and they were expected. It was their bed. And she was 5'9". Oh my God. This guy, I wish I could remember who it was. I think this guy's it was. wife, and he was 5'5". Five, five, so, because they were talking about the clothes up in the, and up in the, above the bed, and, and the, uh, the, uh, the person giving us the tour was like, fortunately she was 5'9", so she could reach up and get clothes for them, and they didn't have to climb up. 
So after the tour of the house, and they only give you a tour of the, the first floor, you don't go, there's three floors actually to, to Monticello, and you don't go up to the other floors. But. So after that, you're, you're allowed for a couple hours to roam around the grounds. So we decided to take what is called the slave tour. Because as you probably know, Thomas Jefferson, contrary to everything, um, was a slave owner. So we took the slave tour. And the slave tour was mostly a lecture. We went to three different places and she pointed out um, a house they recreated. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't a home there anymore, one of the homes there anymore. Um, but in um, like 10 years ago, somebody built a recreation of one. And it, um, it was small. Um, so we, she spoke there, and then we went over to a place where they had the uh, nail factory because they made nails there. That was one of the things they did. And she showed us the textile place where they, they weave. And there was the discussion of slavery. And, you know, hello, Thomas Jefferson had slaves. And I, I was very disturbed by it, actually. Um, it was very interesting, of course, but it was very disturbing, even though I knew that that was there. And I started thinking about, now where's, where's the lesson here, the metaphysical lesson here, not the obvious lesson, but the metaphysical lesson. And I, and I thought about his life and I said, there's, there was some separation there between his high ideals and how he lived his life. There was some dichotomy there between the idea that he had about this country and the Declaration of Independence of this country and the action he took. There was, there's an obelisk at his grave because he's buried on the property that he insisted have the following inscription. Here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and father of the University of Virginia. Those are the three things he felt was the, his most important contributions in his life. Now, interestingly enough, in the original draft of the Declaration, and you can learn this in the movies, you can learn this in the, uh, the musical 1776, uh, in the original draft of the Declaration, uh, in damning, fiery prose, as he was known to be able to do, Jefferson actually denounced the slave trade as an execrable commerce, as an assemblage of horrors, a cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberties. He called slavery, slavery a moral depravity and a hideous blot and presented the greatest threat to the survival of the new American nation. And yet he owned, over his lifetime, 600 enslaved people. And we know that because he took copious notes. It was said uh, about him, never did a man achieve more fame for what he did not do because he talked a lot, even though those words were removed from the, from the Declaration, as we know, um, mostly because of the southern states insisted on that, so that they would sign it. But, but he did rail against this practice. And yet he, his actions didn't show that. Out of the 600 slaves he had over his lifetime, he only freed seven, five or seven, two of which were actually his sons, as you might have heard the story about Sally Hemings, um, who was, uh, she was a nanny to his children by his, his um, legal wife, um, and then in France, when he was in France, and she, uh, she at first refused to go back to America with him because in France there was no slavery, so she was a quote unquote freed person. And he said he didn't like that, so he made a deal with her. He gave her extra privileges, 
Uh, and wow. he, he promised that at the age of 21, their sons would be free. Um, so when he died, though she wasn't technically free in his will, because like I said, he only did that for five or seven people, um, she was given uh, extra privileges. She didn't have to work, and she actually moved into town to Charlottesville and, was, and lived a life of a quote-unquote freed um, individual, even though technically she wasn't. So you see, even though you kind of learn a little bit about this, you don't until you really sit there and hear it and look at the the plantation and what was going on. It doesn't. It really starts to get you the, the, the disgust of it. So what I I wanted to understand this. I wanted to understand what was going on. I wanted to see how that related to to us now. And um, I, I came to the conclusion that his ideas and his ideals, though they were correct, obviously, they were filtered by the times. They were filtered about his, his ideas of humanity. The man had strange ideas of humanity. Yes, he believed that slavery shouldn't be present, but he also bought into the BS about the African Americans or the Africans in general not being, um, you know, that five tenths thing, you know, not being on the. That he had this triangle. He wrote this book. I forgot what it's called. Um, where he uh, he had levels of humanity, and of course, the top level was white men who were landowners, not just white men, but white men who were landowners. Then came the natives, or he called the aborigines, which I guess you could say the natives of any nation are the aborigines of that nation. Um, then came women. <laughs> then came the African people. So he had this perspective of life, of people, and all that was filtered. So even though he had this great idea of freedom, and especially um, uh, religious freedom, which is what a lot of, of, of people ran away from uh, uh, England for. Um, but all of it was rooted in discrimination, in racism, and in sexism. Because, you know, when I read, when I read the Declaration and, and in my rewrite of the Declaration, my New Thought version of it, you know, I talk about mankind, not man as an agenda. That's not what they were talking about. They were talking about men. All men are created equal. Not men, not women. Not mankind, not women, but men. So, was he a hypocrite or a creature of his times? Because, you know, he despised the practice of slavery. And, but, but then again, he felt if we emancipate um, the African Americans, there's going to be a bloody war. And we fought a bloody war over it, the Civil War. But it got me thinking about the filters that we have in our minds. Maybe not as intense, maybe not um, affecting thousands of people, if not more, hundreds of thousands of people, but they affect us. We have these ideas of having greater money, having a better health, whatever that means, having more love in our lives, more friends, a better job, all that good stuff. We keep thinking about that, we work on it, we declare, we decree, but we have these filters that come along with these high ideals that we have. And some of those filters come with um, imitating social norms that we've picked up and you know what our parents taught us and what we learned in, in, in a church atmosphere, what we learned in school. And that in our lives, we start our own civil war in our heads and in our experiences. And you know, the law hears all that. The law does, does not filter out what you're filtering in. The law hears the junk in our heads, the stuff we still accept from 
long ago or yesterday or whatever. And as we, and you can see that in your life, look at your experiences. Um, they're always a red flag, you know, when, when your experience, what you decide to declare and decree in your life, you know, um, you, you know, maybe you get a new car, but it's a lemon. Maybe you, maybe you, um, you win the lottery, but it's four dollars. And other things like that. It's not all about money, obviously. Because there's still something in our heads, in our beliefs, that those high-minded declarations and decrees are being filtered through. And so the law goes, oh, okay, you want it that way? Okay, well, well just a second. And it does what it needs to do to bring that $4 lottery ticket. That job that you wanted but now realize, no, man, just, gosh, I'm going to get sick of this drive whatever. If your ideas and ideals are high-minded or abundant or prosperous but are filtered by your beliefs of I'm not enough or whatever is going on in your self-talk, that's what's going to show up. Raymond Charles Barker wrote the book The Power of Decision. Excellent book. He said, success or failure cannot be explained by anything other than the use and misuse of mental processes. The subconscious mind produces what we place in it. It is a creative process. It is a law of action. And that's why sometimes, you know, we're taught, and I teach it, and I believe it, that, you know, you change your thoughts, um, you change your life, and it can happen immediately. You know, a millisecond after that clicks. But sometimes, and, and we need to watch for that, Sometimes we're not quite there in our belief. And that's okay. We got a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff that's gone on. So what what we what we need to do at that moment is go, well, okay, wait a minute. This is not quite what I declared to decree. What's going on? And we have to dig a little deeper sometimes. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper. And how we do that is we be constant and conscious and consistent and, and infectious even with this de declaration and decree that we are doing with our new ideas. Spiritual treatment work is the shifting of your attention from a negative focus to a positive idea and holding it there long enough for it to register in the subconscious mind, says Barker again. So sometimes that takes, uh, that takes a little time, and that's okay. What's great is knowing that, oh, okay, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm further. But I've stepped in, and you know what? I'm grateful that I've stepped this far. So now I'm going to step this far. And then closer and closer, our health gets better. Closer and closer, those um, friends that aren't really great friends, they start to drift away because they're not getting back from you what is attracting them to you. And so those um, emotional vampires start leaving your life. And that's so exciting when that happens. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we have to take the time to do some hard work, to do some deep work. And, and when we do that, we have to know and be grateful that we're doing that. Not like, oh, how did that get in there and be all angry at ourselves? Because you know, so much is going on. We accept so much because there's other things. I've got bills. i got to put a new light bulb in. i got to do this. i got to do that. i got to do, you know, I have children. i got to take them to soccer, whatever it is. Things are always happening. And we slip. We get away from this. That. And we ought to know that's okay because we also know that we have the power to step back into it. Charles Barker again. As you think yourself in larger terms, you invite larger ideas into your consciousness. So, what we what I want to ex express here is that we need to do better than Jefferson. He had high ideals, but he got caught up in um, 
the times he got caught up in um, his financial stuff and he didn't have the courage he could have had to step away. He didn't look deep enough and go, you know what? I know my bank loans are based on my ownership, quote unquote, of these people, but too bad, I'll figure it out. Because you know he died in debt. He died in what would today be $2 million in debt, which his uh, grandson, I believe, had to figure out how to, because there was no bankruptcy back then. You paid it. So we want to put in our lives a better practice. And when we see something is not working, we extricate ourselves from that. If it is a job that's not working, then we take action to look for another one. No matter what the career, no matter how much money we're being paid, no matter, no matter what, if it's taking so much time that it's making us ill, it's, it's ruining our, our family lives, it's time to go away. It's not worth it. But you take action, you don't just leave, you take action by looking for something else. And knowing and inviting in your heart, in your mind, in your treatment work, in your spirit work, spiritual work, that it's going to show up. And then take the action. We have to decide to be abundant. We have to decide to be in better health. We have to decide to be surrounded by loving relationships and then take action. Listen for what the universe is telling you to take action with. It's going to say, you'll hear it. You'll hear it. You'll hear the red flags when you allow it to reveal itself in you. When you sit and you stay quiet for a moment and listen, what is mine to do? I have these ideas, but something is filtering them, and, and they're, they're all cockeyed. What is mine to do? And you'll hear an answer. You'll hear a little answer maybe sometimes. You'll hear a big answer sometimes. But they'll lead because the, the law, the, the law, the, the spirit is so in love with all of us, it will lead us to our best in our ideals. So let us decide, let us declare, and let us decree. Because what your mind can conceive, you can achieve. Better than Jefferson. Better than you did before you got here. Have at it. Namaste. Namaste.